This is going to be a lecture about a lot of things. I mean, certainly it's going to be a lecture about data compression. I'm sure you figured that part out already. It's going to be a lecture that talks about these two concepts, which really are more of the basic techniques that we need for compression. We talked in the last lecture about some basic techniques. Arguably, these are two fundamental techniques that we need to know if we're going to study data compression. And as we learn more about compression schemes, these two concepts are going to come up again and again. And in particular, in late June, we're going to spend a lot of time suddenly talking about different mechanisms for prediction, something that we're going to see for the very first time today. But although the lecture covers these two concepts, I think the overarching conceptual material of this lecture is about context. It's about the ability of a compressor to assume that the decompressor has certain information and avoid transmitting that information as a result and therefore save some space. And for this lecture, I'm going to assume that you have the context of all of the previous lectures. So I assume that if you're getting to this lecture, then by now you've either attended all of the previous lectures in person or you've watched the videos for them, and therefore that you have that knowledge. And yes, in the back of my head, I'm aware that sometimes people don't attend or watch the videos, but I'm sure you know in that case you're sort of on your own. And if you've seen all the previous lectures already, then I'll be able to assume, as I go through this lecture, that you have certain context, and I won't have to spend time giving it to you again. So if I want to talk about run length encoding, or I want to compare a scheme that we developed to LZW, well, because those things were already covered, I can assume you already know them. So I won't need to spend half an hour explaining run length encoding to you, and by doing that, I can save some time by assuming you already have that context. So maybe that's an example of how we can save bandwidth by leveraging context, by assuming that the receiver of our data, our decompressor, already knows certain things. So conceptually, the lecture is about all of that stuff. But really, the lecture, I think, the overarching story arc of this lecture is a story about data. It's a series of experiments that we're doing with data, and I hope that this lecture demonstrates a design process you could use when designing a compression scheme in a scientific way. So the data we're going to talk about in this lecture is topography data, or maybe we could call it elevation data. I'm going to alternate back and forth during the lecture between these two terms. Uh, and the visualization that I have produced here, so I used a GIS program to generate this visualization, uh, is of a small swatch of topography data from the Canadian Digital Elevation Model, which I guess I will pronounce CDEM during this lecture. And the Canadian Digital Elevation Model is a publicly available source of data where you can retrieve information about the elevation of land in Canada. And the, and the, the data is provided as a basically a 2D array of values, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But you can retrieve it from basically anywhere in Canada with a couple of exceptions, uh, and it gives you the height of land, the altitude of each cell of land uh, in the data set that you request. And there's a massive amount of data available. Um, the little swatch that I've shown shown here is a piece of data from Victoria. Uh, it is the northeastern corner of Victoria, or perhaps you could say the southeastern corner of the Saanich Peninsula, a neighborhood broadly, I guess, called um, Gordon Head. And inside of Gordon Head, you can find the UVic campus. So those of you who attend classes on UVic, they're sort of in this general area. Uh, you may know that just southwest of UVic, there's a mountain called Mount Talmy. It's a great place to go for a walk if you need some nature in the middle of the day at UVic. Um, up here in the other corner of our data set, we have this mountain. So until recently, so growing up in Victoria, I would call this mountain Mount Douglas. But as of 2022, its original name of Pickles has been officially restored. So please forgive me if during this lecture I accidentally call it Mount Douglas again. I'm still getting used to the name change. Uh, and many of you that uh, are uh, attending UVic may actually live inside of this neighborhood, but many of you may not, and both of those points will be relevant later. So this is a very small piece of data if we're talking about topography, even if we're just talking about the topography of Victoria. This doesn't cover all of Victoria. Now, the data itself is represented as a 2D array of integer values. Now, this is important because later I'm going to want to make a few assumptions about the data. And one easy assumption I can make is that if my input format is restricted in some way, then obviously all of my data will have that format. So the CDEM data, when it's exported uh, through their online portal, and I guess I should add at this point that if you go visit the online portal, you can still retrieve the CDEM data, although it does sort of sheepishly say that this model is considered to be out of date or obsolete. Elite. 
I think that that's more because there are newer models that have better resolution or something, as opposed to the fact that this elevation data is completely out of date because all of the elevations have changed. Elevations do change over time, but I don't think the overall geography of Canada has changed that much in the last 10 or 15 years to render this experiment that we're going to perform completely irrelevant. So we'll continue using the CDEM data. And it's provided as essentially a 2D array of integer values, where each value gives the elevation of a particular more or less rectangular piece of land um, corresponding to a cell of our 2D grid. Uh, and it's just the, ele the average elevation. So this cell here, if we look and in finer resolution, maybe if we break it up into four subcells, it turns out that one of the subcells has elevation 130 and one of them has uh, elevation 123 or something. But the elevation that we get is an integer that corresponds to some aggregation that they have performed to produce the average elevation for that cell above sea level in meters. And I'll talk in a few minutes about some assumptions we can make about that. Uh, in particular, when are we going to see negative values? Now, at this resolution, I have to be very careful about how I phrase this. But just for the sake of uh, giving you a sense of scale, if I take a look at one of these 2D arrays representing elevation data, and this particular one, the one we're actually looking at, these numbers correspond to the top left corner of the data I use to generate this visualization. Now, you'll notice the visualization is actually a contour plot. It seems to be continuous. It's been produced by taking this discrete 2D array and drawing level curves on it. So by a contouring algorithm, which is an interesting thing to talk about in some visualization course, but not here. Um, and so uh, at this resolution, we can assume that if, roughly speaking, with a couple of caveats that I'll get to later, if I look at a particular cell and ask, you know, what's, this, what's the resolution of the data set, the distance between the center of one cell and the center of another cell more or less is about 20 meters. I say more or less because it turns out the cells themselves aren't square on the Earth's surface. They're sort of rectangular with a bit of distortion because of the fact that the Earth is not flat. Um, and if you think the Earth is flat, please come by the office hours. We can talk about that. Uh, so let's, let's assume that the distance between the centers of two neighboring cells is more or less 20 meters. It turns out that actually cells are a bit less tall than they are wide. So although this representation is just LaTeX drawing me a 2D array, it turns out that actually on the, the the, in real terms, cells are a little bit squashed. We'll come back to that later in the lecture. But just for scale, think of each cell as being about 20 meters wide. Now, this model only tracks elevation of land. It doesn't worry about the depth of the ocean. So elevation values for ocean cells are always set to zero. We just assume that the ocean is a continuous flat expanse at zero meters above sea level. There are data sets I'm sure you can get, even data sets curated by the Canadian government, that track the, the, the depth of the seafloor. That's a different lecture, frankly. Uh, and although we could use many of the same techniques as this one, but we need to know our data. So what that means is uh, if we see a large swath of cells with zero, we are going to adopt the convention just for our own sake to be able to intuitively understand the data that this should mean, if I look at a bunch of zero cells next to each other, that's probably the ocean. That's probably an area of water. Although to be clear, technically, there could be cells with elevation zero that are actually on land. That could happen. You can have a cell that's inland that happens to have be zero meters above sea level. Even if that occurs, it'll, it'll occur rarely. So we're going to adopt the convention just for the sake of visualizations that if we see zero cells, we're going to call those water. And if I talk about water cells, I'm talking about cells with elevation zero. Uh, some data sets, so uh, the way you could retrieve data like this is you go through, for example, the CDEM online portal and, and request a particular area of land, like a, a particular, you provide coordinates of a rectangle of land you want to see the elevations of, and it provides you this 2D grid. Now, although the data set is meant to cover all of the Canadian land mass, there could be situations where it can't. So one one reason you can end up with a data set that is missing data is suppose you ask for a swatch of data that runs off the edge of the available area. So that, that in that case, um, the model would indicate to you, sorry, I don't actually have any data for these cells over here on the edge because you've run off the edge of the area of this model. It doesn't want to call these things elevation zero because they might not be ocean. They could be anything. Instead, it uses a special marker to say, sorry, these cells are invalid. I've got nothing for them. I've got no idea what, um, what's here. If it's land, if it's water, how, what the elevation is. The invalid marker could also show up inland. 
So I could have random cells in the middle of my data set that are just missing. And so the data set has a special marker to indicate that situation. One reason that could occur is when they actually create this data set for all of Canada, they're probably stitching together pieces of data they've gathered from elsewhere, and maybe the pieces of data don't line up perfectly. And so there are little gaps between the pieces. Now, that's a topic again for a different course, but keep that in mind. If we need to know our data, we should be prepared to see invalid markers anywhere in our data set. Now, the compression techniques I designed in this lecture won't go out of their way to um, work around these invalid markers. They'll just uh, acknowledge that they might be present and maybe achieve bad compression if invalid markers are present. One bit of future work when we get to the end and see our final results is it's likely we could really improve on our final results for some of our data sets that we're going to see if we develop a, um, I, I guess, more intelligent way of handling these invalid markers, these invalid cells. So here's a task for this lecture, the task I want to spend the next, I don't know, hour and a half or so talking about. I would like to develop a compression scheme that is specialized for this kind of data set. I want to write something that compresses this data. If I give you a large 2D array of integer values corresponding to elevations above sea levels of little rectangular parcels of land, I want to find a way of compressing that data losslessly. And immediately, when we talk about specialized compression schemes, that leads us into a bunch of questions that I've actually already spent a bit of time on. So these questions here, I got a bit ahead of myself. I've actually discussed these questions a lot in previous videos. So if you're watching lectures on video, I'm not going to waste more of your time talking about this. We've already gone around in circles about this enough. I do have to justify this. So I've said before, when we begin talking about compression uh, schemes for specific inputs, we do have to explain ourselves a little bit because people could ask, and I think it's relevant to ask questions like, wait a minute, if you're developing a, uh, developing a compression scheme for one specific style of input, or worse, one specific input file, how do I know you're not cheating when you tell me you achieve compression? For example, if I end up using a five megabyte decompressor tool to decompress whatever I end up compressing, how am I not cheating uh, if I don't include the size of the decompressor in my compressed when I'm measuring how much compression I achieve? The issue, as I've mentioned in previous lectures, is that the more specific your data sets, your input data sets get, the more likely you could cheat by hiding stuff in your decompressor executable or whatever. However, for this particular type of data, there is so much of it available, and we could use any intuition that we derive, any tricks or heuristics we come up with in this lecture to compress arbitrary topography data, not just the CDAM data. Because we could use these tools to compress any topography data we come up with, even later uh, topography models that use finer resolution, I would argue there is essentially an infinite amount of possible input data. And so our specialization isn't so strict that we should worry about being seen as cheating by having a large decompressor or whatever, because our input data sets could get so big, they could be gigabytes or terabytes in size, that it doesn't matter how big our decompressor is, the decompressor has a constant size, and that will be eclipsed by the size of our input data sets. So for example, this data set here, the one I used to make this visualization, and we'll look at a second, uh, second visualization of this data later in the lecture, this is a data set that is 545 by 656, and there are a total of about 350,000 data points. And this covers a small fraction of a relatively small city, Victoria isn't that big of a city, on the tip of a small island. So Vancouver Island, the island that contains Victoria, is not the smallest island on Earth. There are definitely a lot of smaller islands, but there are larger islands too. And Vancouver Island is a very small part of Canada as a whole, geographically. So this data set, this one that I've used as an example, is an absolutely tiny fraction of the overall data available just through the CDEM elevation model. And uh, we could design other elevation models later at finer resolution or for other parts of the world and use the same insights we derive today for that. So I would argue that really there's so much topography data out there that our specialization is more like a specialization to a specific domain like images or sound. If I design a compressor just for images or a compressor just for sound files, you wouldn't accuse me of cheating there because there are so many sound files and image files out there that if I write a general image compressor, I could reuse it over and over again for all eternity. And that's why I argue this application falls into the same bucket. There's so much topography data out there, and there will be so much created in the future that any tools I create are pretty general, even if they're specialized just to topography data.
And moreover, uh, one of the reasons I want to do this, regardless of whatever philosophical points we can make about whether it's cheating to call something compression, uh, it seems like if I have terabytes and terabytes of topography data, I would want to find a very efficient way of storing it. So a tool like this could be very useful in practice. Although, of course, the ones in practice will design over more than, let's say, 90 minutes. That might take weeks or months. Uh, so what, I, what I'm getting at here is I want to, uh, before we start experimenting with schemes, before I begin comparing file sizes, I want to justify the techniques I'm going to use uh, experimentally. I, I want to say the experimental techniques I'm using, the way I'm going to say that I achieved good results is justified. Because as you know, once I begin looking at numbers and, and changing the way I measure things, it begins to look like I'm trying to put a finger on the scale. So uh, I need to make sure if I develop a compression scheme for this kind of data, I should test it out on a variety of different terrain. I can't test it necessarily on everything, but I should be conscious of the types of topography that could occur, um, not just in Canada, but arguably anywhere, um, with a few restrictions that are, I guess, natural consequences of the type of data the CDEM model provides. So for example, I like this particular input data set because it contains water, so large, essentially flat sections of water. It contains a couple of mountains Mountains. It contains other sort of general hill and valley uh, topography, but also a lot of pretty flat areas um, and coastal areas and areas far away from the coast. But I should also make sure I test my compression schemes on data sets that are entirely land-based or almost entirely land-based with minimal water, or, or data sets that are almost entirely water-based, or data sets that are primarily mountains, or data sets that are primarily flat. I need to make sure that I test it on a wide variety of terrain so that I don't try a couple of data sets that weren't chosen very well and then claim I've got a great compression scheme. For the sake of this lecture, I'm going to simplify that a little bit. I'm going to provide data from a, a, a several different data sets I have produced, uh, but they're all in BC, and arguably, yes, if I were designing a compression scheme for all topography in Canada, I'd want to use a lot more test data, but there's a limit to how much people will put up with in a lecture, so I'm going to try and split the difference. Um, because the set of possible inputs is so massive, because there's so much topography data out there, I believe that we can compare two different attempts at compressing the data, or for example, compare some specialized scheme we come up with with gzip by simply comparing the size of the compressed output file. And maybe, although I won't do it in this lecture, I might want to consider things like how long does it take to compress. Although I will say in advance, it turns out the results we get in this lecture are um, take an amount of time about even with this, the big three compression tools. So we're, we won't worry about a runtime comparison, but I might care about that as well. Since there is so much possible input data, um, I argue that we can compare the performance of a compression scheme just by looking at the size of the output file. That's it. Um, if there was only a small amount of possible input data, like if I'm compressing just one possible file, then I'd want to include the size of the decompressor in my measurement. But in this case, there's so much data, it could get so large that even if the decompressor program was huge, like 100 megabytes in size, if I'm compressing a terabyte of data or two terabytes of data, it's going to eclipse the, the constant size of my decompressor tool. Uh, and then there's this question again, as I said, I've talked about this in previous lectures, if I were to develop a compressor who, which was designed to compress one specific file, then I, I would probably not be able to measure performance fairly unless I measured the compressed size by both the output file size and the size of the executable, the decompressor executable. Um, I, I believe my argument is sound for why I'm not going to do that here. I'll add that if I did have to do that here, it would be a bit of a mess because how do we measure the size of an executable? It isn't sufficient necessarily just to compile it and look at the number of bytes because I could have to, you know, maybe my compiler is wasting space. There are a lot of things we can do to optimize the size of an executable. Um, that is something we're not going to worry so much about in this course, although it is a really interesting topic. So what assumptions can we make to begin with? Before we begin trying to write a scheme, what can we do to narrow down um, the domain of, of decisions we have to make? Well, one of them is the CDEM model. One assumption we can make is that the CDEM model provides us data in integer form. It's not floating point data, it is integers. Uh, and I'm going to argue that we can store every element of the data as a 16-bit unsigned integer. So it's not going to be negative, and it's not going to be larger than 2 to the 6, well, 2 to the 16 all minus 1, which is this number. 
And I need to make an argument for that. I'm allowed to make assumptions, but I need to be able to justify them, and I have to be able to justify them in general. So I can't say something like, well, in Gordon Head, we never see altitudes above, I don't know, 300 meters or something. So why don't I assume that I can store all of my elevation values in nine bits? No, that's ridiculous. Unless I'm sure that I'm never going to see an elevation above 300 meters, it doesn't make sense for me to state an arbitrary restriction on elevation. I am allowed to develop a scheme that is optimized for low elevations, but I can't assume that no input will have a high elevation. So I have to be careful when I make an assumption like this to have a pretty general justification for it. So the first justification I'm going to make is, well, I don't want to go around talking about the maximum elevation on a particular data set, but if I do a bit of research, and I have done a little bit of research, the maximum elevation from sea level anywhere on Earth is under 9,000 meters. Uh, now, it's true that if I design a scheme today and over the years tectonic shifts occur and mountains get higher or, I don't know, the entire ocean evaporates or something, which I don't think is that likely, I hope, um, then maybe the maximum distance from sea level to the top of the highest mountain becomes larger than 9,000 meters. So I shouldn't make an assumption along the lines of, oh, I'll never see an elevation above 9,000. But it is reasonable, I think, to make assumptions that allow, that restrict my maximum elevation as long as they use this number with a large tolerance. If currently there is nothing on Earth above 9,000 meters, then I think it's reasonable for me to say something like, well, I'll design a scheme that can tolerate elevations up to, I don't know, 20,000 meters. I doubt that my scheme is going to become obsolete in the near future because of elevation changes. And so if I say that we can use an elevate, we can represent elevations that are 16 bits, that is uh, any elevation between these two numbers, I would argue that it's not really going to be my problem by the time that elevations on Earth rise to above 65 kilometers. Maybe that'll happen one day. That would be really weird, but if it does, I suspect that it would no longer be my problem. If you're watching this video 5,000 years or 5 million years in the future, and for some reason you are living on a planet where elevations are bigger than 65,000 and taking a compression course where you need this video, you should complain to your university, wherever it is. You can send me an email. I don't think I'm going to respond to it 5 million years in the future. If I do, good for me. Um, so there's also the question, though, of what about negative elevations? So uh, you look at this and say, well, if I use 16 bits, I can represent elevations that are between 0 and 65,000. Well, certainly that allows for any elevation I'm likely to see on Earth in my lifetime. What about negative elevations? Can, do they exist? I mean, is it possible for there to be an area of land with a negative elevation? And there's a two-part answer to that. Well, okay, so the answer is yes. It turns out that um, it is. There are places on Earth, even places relatively near to Canada, so the United States has areas of land with a negative ele elevation, where you've got the ocean here, and then the land starts, and then for some reason inland, you actually go down below sea level, but it's dry. There's no water there, so it is an area of land. Um, those exist. So just to be clear, before you email me about that, those places do exist. There are no such places in Canada. That's one reason that uh, we don't need to worry about them so much. And in this example, for this lecture, I'm going to assume that all of our elevations are zero or positive. That's why I'm going to use unsigned integers. But you might look at that and say, that sounds like a cop-out. After all I've said in the last few minutes about choosing a general scheme that I could extend to all topography on Earth, why am I allowed to make this assumption? And as a student, I was always really annoyed by this. I was always really annoyed by having somebody, you know, giving a lecture all high and mighty saying, you should never make assumptions, and they, they just go and make a bunch of assumptions and don't justify them. So I'm, I'm a bit touchy about this. Here is my justification. For the sake of this lecture, um, it's probably easier for all of us to think in terms of unsigned values. That's just my opinion, but I want to make the, the material accessible from an, I guess, intuitive standpoint. To be clear, though, if I were to use signed arithmetic, so if I used 16 bits, but I chose to use signed values, everything in this lecture would still apply. Everything would work perfectly. So if instead of using 0 through 65,000, I chose to use, let's say I used signed arithmetic with 2's complement, which is probably a bit of a naive choice in this case. But suppose I use 2's complement signed arithmetic, well then I could represent in 16 bits any elevation between negative 32,000 uh, 768 and positive 32,767. All of the techniques I'm about to describe would still apply. 
if I chose to use negative values. And notice that because my maximum elevation on Earth is 9,000, 32,000 gives me a lot of tolerance. This system is significantly overbuilt, so I could still do this. Um, so I'm going to make the conscious decision to use unsigned arithmetic, but please understand that if everything changed so that negative elevations were allowed, I believe all of this logic would still hold. One last note about that, though. Um, if I did use signed arithmetic, the reason I consider this to be sort of naive is that although, yes, I might see negative elevations, I strongly doubt that you're going to see anywhere on Earth a, an area of land on Earth that is 32,000 meters below sea level. That's ridiculous, I think. Maybe not, well, at least it's ridiculous in 2023. So if I chose to use signed arithmetic, I might use a representation not from negative 32 to positive 32, but maybe like negative 4,000 or negative 1,000 to positive 64,000. So I, I might choose a more nuanced representation for the negative elevations, not just splitting them halfway like, like I could do with two's complement. All right, so if we accept that for the sake of this lecture, we will work with unsigned values, because in Canadian topography, we're not going to see any negative elevations, um, then the question becomes, how do we store our data to begin with? So before we've compressed it, what does our input data look like? What is the input format? Uh, and what I'm going to do for this lecture is, for this, uh, because I want to perform a scientific experiment where I compare the output of our compression schemes against the big three, so against gzip, bzip, and lzma, uh, I want to have an input format that we understand intuitively. I want it to be something we can easily sort of visualize. Now, the CDEM data itself, when you export it from their web portal, actually arrives in ASCII format. That is to say, um, in the CDEM uh, ASCII files, it might say something like the number, it might actually write the words, number of columns equals 100, and then the number of rows equals 1,000. And then it actually gives in ASCII, so as, as character data, it actually gives the elevation of each cell, just one row at a time, as text. And of course, that's a very inefficient format for storing data like this because it's text. I mean, representing numbers as text always inflates the data. The reason why that's also a bit of a nasty format for our use is that if I try and compress this text-based data format directly, my compression tool has to be able to either parse text so that is actually, you know, digest these numbers by parsing them, which is both time consuming and requires extra programming logic, or the compression tool has to compress this just like a text file. That is, it can't use very many specializations for numerical data. Neither of those are a good idea from the perspective of this lecture. So what I will do is take that ASCII data that the CDEM model provides and transform it to a very simple binary format. And that will be the input format for our compression experiment. Because this is essentially a one-to-one -one transformation, that is, I can take the ASCII format, transform it into the format I'm about to describe, and vice versa, I don't believe that it's changing the overall character of the problem at all. I also think that internally inside the when I export the data from the server, I'm getting this ASCII data, but internally in the server, I'm sure it's stored in some kind of binary format. Storing it as ASCII has a lot of other disadvantages. There is a couple, there are a couple of other pieces of data that the model provides when you export data. So if you export a big 2D grid, it will also provide you some metadata like uh, what are the latitude and longitude of the top left corner which allows you, if you use the data for something, to know where on Earth the data actually is located and not have to keep that information. Because these are just two numbers, I would argue that our compression schemes can ignore them. We won't include them in our compression because we could always transport those two numbers separately from our compressed data. Whereas if this is two terabytes of a 2D grid, obviously compressing this is sort of a higher priority than compressing these two um, maybe floating point or integer values. So for those reasons, I have decided to boil down our input data to just the 2D grid of elevation values in a simple binary format. So if I'm storing an n by m grid of topography data, uh, that would be n rows and m columns. So n is the number of rows. I'm going to use matrix-like notation here. So that's n rows and, and m columns. Uh, I've already said that I'm going to store every value, uh, every elevation value as a 16-bit unsigned integer. Uh, and that includes the height and the width. So I'll store uh, this data in a very simple binary format that consists of the height of the grid as the first 16-bit value, and we'll store them as big endian unsigned integers. So that would be network byte order, just, just to make sure we're being magnanimous. Um, I store the height in 16 bits. I store the width in 16 bits. So any program reading this now knows how big of an array to create. And then I've got my big 2D array. 
uh, and its height is n, and its width is m. And then I just store each row of my grid from left to right. So I store it in row major order. So I store all of row zero, that would be this. Then I store all of row one, then all of row two from left to right. So starting at the top left and working my way across to the right and then moving one row down and repeating. Now we'll see later in the course that there actually are clever ways you can store data that makes it maybe easier to compress in some cases by storing it as sort of a back and forth pattern. We're not gonna worry about that for this lecture. Uh, we'll come to it again when we talk about image compression. One of the reasons I like this binary format, besides the fact that it does give us, hopefully if you think about the format, it's a bit more intuitive what's going on than if we talk about text-based data. Another thing that's really nice from the point of view of measuring compression is that the size of the file can be computed based on the number of data points, and that's it. The size of the input file is exactly the same for all grids of the same size. So any compression I achieve, uh, I guess it's easier for us to visualize the compression advantage based on the size of the grid. There are, of course, other file formats where the size of the file depends on other factors besides the size of the grid. So if I have an n by m grid, this is the number of bytes that I need. So there are this number of data values, two data values for n and m, and then m times n data values for the grid itself. We multiply each thing by two because each data value is stored as 16 bits, so two bytes. Um, for the sake of having some test data, I have created these four test data sets that are in that binary format from the previous slide. And I have, well, they'll be posted to the extent I can. So I have a feeling this huge one, I may not be able to post on the LMS because of the limits on space and UVIX LMSs. If you want this one, we'll have to work something out. Um, let me know and I can figure out a way of providing it to you. Um, maybe bring a flash drive to the office hours, I guess. So I've exported these data sets from the CDEM model, converted them to our binary format. Um, and there's a mixture of them, but they are all from BC because I want to keep a nice local flavor to these lectures, um, they are all from around here. Uh, and I hope that they contain enough diversity of terrain that we believe we are achieving legitimate compression when we do. But it's true that yes, if you're developing a general scheme for all, of topog all the topography data in Canada, you pr would probably want to go and test this out on data from the Atlantic provinces or Hudson's Bay or Ontario or the prairies or the north or the Arctic Ocean or whatever, I get that. But for the sake of keeping things simple and nice and local, I will use these four data sets. Uh, and so I'll just go over them quickly. Uh, when you download data sets from CDEM, it provides you a visualization, a very nicely formatted image um, that sort of visualizes it using more traditional topography colors. So here is our Gordon Head data set from earlier. You'll notice that this representation seems a little bit stretched. And that's because in the visualization we saw earlier, I had used the GIS program to render the visual visualization using a map projection closer to the way the land actually looks. Um, whereas this elevation model, when they, when they created the data set, they didn't make sure that each individual cell of data was exactly square on Earth. Um, or even close to square. The, the cells are actually rectangular. Uh, and that means that each cell is actually um, a little bit uh, shorter than it is wide. And that's why you get this stretched appearance. Now, for our purposes, that's not too big of a deal. Just keep that in mind. So for full disclosure, the, the cells are actually a little bit squished because of the way that they're measured inside of the model. So gordonhead.bin is the data set we've talked about already in this lecture. Um, hind.bin is a huge data set. So it's much larger by orders of magnitude than the other ones. It's about 180 megabytes compared to 70, uh, uh, 700K for the Gordon Head one. The hind data set is the midsection of Vancouver Island. Um, somewhere in the middle, I think around here, is a mountain called the Golden Hind, which is the tallest peak on Vancouver Island. And this huge data set not only covers a lot of interesting mountainous stuff, there are also coastal areas. So uh, let's see, up here we have Campbell River in that general area. Just down here we've got the city of Courtney, I think barely visible. Uh, and so we also have uh, some coastal areas that are relatively flat. We've got some more, you know, complicated looking coastal areas there. We've got these huge swaths of water. And in the lower left corner, this black bar, that is a set of invalid cells. So the CDEM model only works with topography of land in Canada. And if I go too far out to sea, if I go too far off the coast, 
uh, the model stops having any data for me. There's nothing available there. So this area of this black bar is a bunch of cells that have no data available. Now humans like us look at this and say that's obviously going to be water, but if our job is to losslessly compress, we have to make sure that our decompressor knows these are invalid cells. In our binary format, um, we will represent invalid cells with this numerical value. So we have to have some value we use to represent invalid cells. We only have the options 0 through 65535, and 0 is taken because 0 is going to be a water cell. 0 is going to be a cell at sea level. So what do we use to represent invalid cells? We're going to just choose the least likely elevation. So this is the elevation I am least likely to ever see on Earth, and I believe it's impossible that we'll see it, so I will reserve this number, which we also could informally think of as sort of negative 1 or something. I will reserve this number number as our invalid marker. So invalid cells appear in our hind data set, and that's it. It turns out no other data set contains invalid cells among the four that we're using. The other two are saltspring.bin. So this is the southern portion of Salt Spring Island. Salt Spring Island actually continues above this, this plot. Um, although I chose this because I, I, I'm just more interested in the southern end of Salt Spring. I think the more mountainous southern end of the island is more interesting for our purposes. Um, Salt Spring has several major uh, mountains on it. One of them, I guess the one you're most likely to see as a tourist is Mount Maxwell, which is basically there. And there are a variety. You can drive up the side of Mount Maxwell, but there's also a bunch of hikes that sort of take you up the peak from the bottom, which is pretty intimidating, I guess. It's probably a day-long hike. The tallest mountain on Salt Spring, I believe, is Mount Tuam, which is this. Um, it's a lot harder to get to the top of Mount Tuam because it's not a provincial park. Uh, you sort of just have to take your chances and just walk up the hill and hope that you're not on somebody else's property. There's also Mount Erskine, which is one of these, which actually is my favorite uh, mountain hike on Salt Spring. Okay, whatever. If you take a ferry to Salt Spring from Victoria, you will end up at Fulford Harbor, which is in that general area. And if you want to do interesting stuff on Salt Spring, if you want to go out for dinner or something, you'd probably go to Ganges, a town that is about there. So that's Salt Spring. Uh, there's also Stuwamis.bin which is a data file exported from the general area of Squamish in British Columbia. Squamish is sort of there. Uh, and you can see it's extremely mountainous. And one of the mountains that's pictured is the Stuwamish Chief Mountain. If you do any rock climbing or you know anything about rock climbing, maybe you've heard of Stuwamish Chief Mountain because it's apparently a great rock climbing destination, also a source of great hikes and whatever. So whatever, British Columbia is a beautiful place to go on a hike and go out for dinner, whatever. We've got these four data sets. Hopefully you can see from be between the four of them, we do have a pretty diverse set of terrain. Lots of uh, water, some data sets that are, that are very heavy on water, so Salt Spring, the Salt Spring data set has lots of water. Some data sets like Stuwamis that have a little bit less water, um, as well as data sets that are more flat and data sets that are more mountainous. I should add, though, that the hind data set itself is so massive and contains such a diverse uh, set of different cells that if I'm achieving good compression on the hind data set only, that's already a pretty good indication my compression scheme is doing something right. So, okay, we know a bit about our data. We've made a few assumptions to narrow down what we're working with. We're now working with unsigned 16-bit integer data represented as a 2D array. What do we do? Is there anything, what is our plan of attack? Well, we've got these techniques we've been learning over the past few lectures. So there are bit reductions, which we're actually not going to worry too much about. It's going to turn out in this lecture, although bit reductions might be helpful in some cases, uh, and there are ways we could squeeze a few more bytes out of our schemes in this lecture using a bit reduction, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Not because it's not useful, but because it wouldn't be as useful as the other techniques we come up with, and you already know a lot about bit reductions. So if you wanted to apply one, you could do that yourself later. We could try run length encoding, which is the first attack I'm going to try. We could also consider the impact of a move to front transform. Although as we saw in the previous lecture, one of the bits of context you bring to this lecture is the fact that the move to front transform isn't a compression technique. It is a technique that can help us. It could queue up RLE to work better, but it doesn't compress anything uh, itself. That's why I'm not going to worry too much about move to front early on. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it any time in this lecture. Uh, it's true that there are some things we see later in the lecture where move to front could help us a bit, but I don't think that it's that productive a technique compared to the major features of this lecture, which are delta compression and prediction. But what about RLE? So if I look at uh, a bit of terrain that's relatively flat, then I will probably see repetitions of the same elevation. Keeping in mind that if we use the ballpark figure of about 20 meters as the cell width, then if I look at three cells in a row, that's about 60 meters. 
And it's possible that if I'm working in relatively flat terrain, that over a 60 meter stretch, I don't see a notable, a noticeable elevation decrease or increase. So it's possible in a relatively flat data set that I will see runs of the same elevation. Uh, and so RLE could probably help me there. But as we saw in the previous lecture, um, there are a lot of trade-offs of RLE that are a bit hard to quantify in this case. We're going to come back to RLE later in this lecture. Um, one issue with RLE that we know is if we use an RLE scheme that does give us a benefit on short runs, like runs of length two or three, usually that comes at a cost on runs of length one. If, on the other hand, we try and use a selective RLE scheme where we only encode runs with RLE if the run is at least, let's say, length four, well, then we get no profit or loss on short runs, but we might be able to get a bit of a benefit on longer ones. I would say because, on average, we can't expect our terrain to be flat. That is, we shouldn't bank on there being too many long runs in our data. Um, there might be runs in our data, but on average, we should expect we're going to have lots of short runs. I would say, in this case, if I chose an RLE scheme, I probably would choose a BZIP-style selective RLE scheme. So I only encode runs if they have length, let's say, at least four. Now, we'll come back to that later in the lecture. Um, usually, we want to apply RLE after trying a few other tricks, maybe at the end, maybe at the beginning before other tricks. But generally, uh, especially for data like this, we wouldn't use only RLE. Um, and the risks here, as I, as I alluded to a minute ago, one of the risks of RLE is that if we have a data set that's extremely mountainous, so it just goes up and down constantly, then we may have no runs at all. And therefore, if we use any RLE scheme that requires overhead, it might inflate our data. So the data sets I would bank on being the worst for RLE would be mountainous ones. What's interesting, though, is that um, one of the schemes we're going to see in a few minutes, so prediction, a prediction-based scheme, could create output symbols that RLE can really um, do a lot of work with. So as usual, RLE is a great scheme by itself if you're working with data that's going to have runs, but sometimes one of your other transformations, one of your other compression tricks can produce data with runs, and RLE can really go to work on that. So what else can we do? Well, our three basic techniques we could have considered, bit reduction, run length encoding, and move to front. Okay, well, move to front, we haven't considered that too much. As I said, it turns out there's not much we can do with it. Um, the problem with using a move to front transform is, as you'll recall, one of the steps in uh, constructing your move to front transform is making a list of all the symbols that could possibly appear. The problem here is that the set of possible symbols is massive. It's every possible elevation value. So it's a bit hard to figure out what to do with a move to front transform in that case. You could still use it, but it may not reap the same benefits you want until we've had a way of maybe hacking away at the problem further. Um, and as I said, bit reductions could be helpful, but we will put those on the back burner for now. So let's just take a look at the data. Let's just stare at the data and see whether anything jumps out at us that would lend itself to compression. So this um, sequence of data, these samples are taken from the third row of this 2D array. So that would be uh, this, this row here. 122, 124, 124, 123, 122, 121. There it is. So the beginning of the third row of the data set on the previous slides. Uh, let's see if we can derive any, any insights from this. So even if we don't know about geography very much, and we probably don't, uh, even if we don't have that expertise, I'll bet that, you know, as people that are used to looking at numbers, we might be able to figure out some tricks that could help us. So one thing I will observe, one sort of obvious thing, is that whether we're geographers or not, it is, you know, I think pretty reasonable to assume that topography is a sort of continuous function. If I'm standing here, so I'm on some land, there I'm standing, and I decide to walk in this direction, it's pretty likely that the land over here is going to be about the same height. It'll be this height, maybe a little bit lower, maybe a little bit higher. Because in general, terrain is sort of gradual. There are hills, there are valleys, but it's pretty unlikely, although it is possible, to encounter a, a severe discontinuity. I mean, I could be standing up here, and there could be this sheer cliff. And I have to make sure that my compression scheme is designed to handle sheer cliffs, but sheer cliffs are relatively unlikely. They do exist, but they don't exist very often. On a typical terrain data set, unless I'm right next to the water, I'm unlikely to see a sheer cliff. 
Still possible, but unlikely. And actually, moreover, if I do see a sheer cliff, it's not that likely to be that tall. There are cliffs in the world that are extremely steep, but the average cliff is not very steep. So in general, I should expect that terrain is sort of a gradual thing. It varies in elevation, maybe it's steep, maybe it isn't, but in general, it's a continuous variation. Um, and so, although I still have to handle huge elevation differences, so a 100 meter drop or whatever, um, I'm allowed to make assumptions, as long as I still have some way of handling them, I'm allowed to optimize my compression to work more on gradual changes and assume that, yes, if I get a 100 meter cliff, maybe that's where I have some expansion occurring. Another observation we can make is that really if we consider the topography relative to a certain position, it doesn't actually make much of a difference where I am, how far up I am. That is, if I see here I'm at 122 and I go up by 2 meters, I stay flat and I go down by 1 meter, then down by 1 meter, then down by 1 meter, well that kind of pattern could occur 100 meters above sea level or it could occur 10 meters above sea level. This kind of gradual difference sort of occurs everywhere. Now it is, the, it is, I believe, true that there are certain geographical or geological features that are more likely to occur at higher altitudes on the logic that the higher up you get, the more likely, the, the less likely there is that there's land at all. That is, if we look at a cross section of a typical, you know, area of the country, sure, there might be a tall mountain somewhere, but if I ask, can you tell me all of the stuff that occurs above the elevation of 500 meters or above the elevation of 100 meters? Well, there's only a certain type of land that tends to occur up there, and it's, you know, the tops of mountains. It is true that there's certain types of terrain that are more likely at higher elevations than lower elevations, but generally speaking, within the elevations we tend to work with, so if you think about the geography of Victoria or whatever other city you please, um, generally speaking, the elevations, if we think of lower elevations, a particular pattern of topography is just as likely to appear 10 meters above sea level as it is 50 meters or 100 meters. What I'm observing is the absolute value of each elevation isn't really that relevant to the pattern that I see, the sort of rolling pattern of topography. Now, if I did have a geography background and I were developing a compression scheme, I could probably leverage my geography knowledge to develop an even better scheme based on characteristics of geography that are more common at higher altitudes or whatever. And it turns out when it comes back to talking about prediction later in the course, we'll think about that. Prediction based on context. And context could include, I know that we're up in the mountains right now. So one other observation I can make is that if I see that I start at 122 and go up by two and then stay flat and go down by one, well, I often will, you know, increase in elevation by two meters. If I look at a data set, I can expect that I will probably see a few cases where I go up by two meters, and certainly quite a few cases where I go up or down by one meter, because generally changes are gradual at a 20 meter resolution. So I can assume that if I look at the difference between neighboring cells, there are certain differences that are more common than others. I'll probably see a lot of cases where I change by zero meters between two cells, or change by one or two meters. It's less likely that I see cases where the difference between two cells is 50 meters. On the other hand, even though I, I can sort of predict the distribution of differences, I can't really predict the distribution of specific altitudes, so specific elevations. If you ask me a question like, how often does the number 123 appear in this data set? I've got no idea. I mean, even a data set that's around 100 meters in elevation, I've got no idea how often this specific absolute number occurs. Because in a sense, this specific number is sort of arbitrary. The model came up with the elevation 123. It could have been the cell had elevation 123.4 and that got rounded down. And some cells had elevation 123.6 and got rounded up. Who knows? The frequency of a particular elevation is sort of arbitrary. We don't really know very much about it. Now, I guess we could look at our whole data set and uh, compute the frequency of everything, and we'll see that there are reasons that could be helpful in the next couple of lectures, but in general, the individual elevation numbers basically mean sort of nothing to me, whereas differences are something that I can predict a bit better. That is, I can assume in, in a data set that's typical terrain, there are going to be a lot of neighbor differences that are, let's say, one or two or zero meters. So that's a third observation, and I think that's a big deal, because what that's telling me is maybe if I'm trying to find ways of condensing this data down, I shouldn't worry so much about the meaning of the number 124. I should instead worry about the relationship, the pattern that I see uh, over a row of data or over a cluster of cells. So how about this? 
given that it appears that neighboring data points are not independent. That is, the height of this cell does seem to be correlated to the height of the cell next to it, or the height of the cell on the other side of it. In general, neighboring data points are not independent. And that the absolute elevation value seems to be sort of arbitrary from my point of view. Why don't we store our data as a series of relative changes? That is, instead of saying this is 122 and this is 124, why don't I say, well, okay, for the sake of perspective, I guess I have to store one absolute number. This is 122, but the one next to it is that plus two, and the one next to that is that plus zero, and the one next to that is that minus one. So instead of storing a bunch of absolute values, I store one absolute value to get us started, and then a bunch of relative changes, a bunch of differences. Differences, that's a long word. There's a lot of syllables. What's a, is there like a mathematical term we use to represent, di oh right, we could represent the difference by the mathematic, by the Greek letter delta. That's the usual mathematical representation. So what we'll do is store the initial value of the row and then track the changes, delta values, between each cell and its neighbor. And if we do that, um, because generally speaking, the rate of change between cells is small. I don't mean small as in two meters or five meters. I mean, in general, it's more likely that it is a smaller number than a large one. If you asked me which of these is more likely, a delta of 100 or a delta of five, then I would say it's probably going to be the five. It's unlikely to be 100. It could occur, but it's unlikely. And what about a delta of 1,000? Well, that could occur, but that's even less likely. Notice that if I talk about the distribution of deltas, there is a sort of intuitive logic behind small deltas being more likely, because generally speaking, terrain changes gradually. And although even in a very uh, uh, abrupt terrain um, elevation change, I'm probably seeing deltas of, I don't know, 10 meters or something, it's very unlikely that I see very high delta values, whereas it's probably very likely that I see low delta values. So negative one, negative five, positive one, positive five. The idea I've come up with is delta compression. We can also call it differential compression. Um, a lot of times you see the word delta compression used for very domain-specific things, and there are some uh, writers that will use differential compression as a general term and delta compression to refer to something specific. I am not one of those people. My delta means difference. I'm going to call any scheme that uses the difference between pieces of data as a compression technique, I'm going to call that delta compression. Delta compression shows up in lots of places, not just in talking about numerical data. One of the reasons we are talking about numerical data is I think it's much more intuitive and require, it has a lower bar to entry, requires a lot less background knowledge. If you've ever seen the words delta compression before, you might have probably seen them in, in a context related to text compression. Um, so revision histories, like what Git is doing internally, often use delta compression. So consider, suppose I'm writing some code and here's revision number one. Revision number one contains a whole bunch of lines and it's obviously going to be C code because what else would you expect from me? Um, and it's got this, this printf statement, hello world. There it is. And I commit this to my repository. And then later, I begin working, I work on my code again, I make a change. For some reason, and I do not recommend this, if you want advice on how to write C code, I've got about 100 C videos out there. Um, for some reason, I decide to write put s instead of printf. Now that's weird for a lot of reasons, one of which is, unless you're actually writing the printf function, you shouldn't need this, that's a separate video, I'm gonna try not to get distracted by that. Let the compiler decide what function to use, just use printf. Suppose in revision two, you have changed that line to say put s instead of printf. Printf. Well, one way of storing this conveniently, keeping in mind that Git is storing every single revision in the repository, and that could be thousands and thousands and thousands of revisions, Git wants a way of storing this efficiently. So if I have a 5,000 line file, do I want to store a second copy of the same 5,000 line file that differs in just one place? Well, maybe not. Maybe what I could do is I could store the new revision um, exactly as it is, so in, in a plain representation, but to save space, because it's likely I'm gonna need the new revision more often than the old revision, what I could do is I could just store a difference between the old and the new. So if I wanted to go from the old to the new, I could say, well, just get rid of these letters and replace it with UTS. So all I have to store to go from revision one to revision two, all I have to store is instructions on what to change. So here are the three letters to change, and then I have to tell you where to put them. If I want to go from the old, uh, from the new back to the old, so in re the reverse direction, which might be a more likely idea in a, in a version control system because you're more likely to need the new revision, then what I'd say is, well, just delete these letters and use R-I-N-T-F. 
so I'll store a difference between the two revisions. That way, if the file is 5,000 lines long, I'm not storing the 5,000 lines over and over again, only the part that changed. And that's a form of delta compression. Um, a more pure form of that for spe the, the specific case of source files is diff and patch. If you compute the diff of two files, there is a, an inverse tool called patch that you can use to recover one file using the other file and the result of diff. And internally, version control systems have often actually used diff and patch, although these days modern ones use their own logic, but it's the same idea. The reason we don't want to talk about delta compression from the point of view of text is that it also requires a bunch of discussion of stuff like string searching, which is not everybody's cup of tea, and it might be information overload. When I'm doing file synchronization, so if I have a set of files, not an ordered repository of some kind, but a set of files on two different machines, and I want to uh, synchronize that set of files, I might use a tool like rsync. Um, if I already have an, an older version of that set of files, I don't want to transmit the stuff I already have. So rsync can use delta compression to figure out what's different between two files and only transmit the, the difference so that it can be recovered. Delta compression shows up all the time when we're working with video. So video is a sequence of frames. There's one frame and then there's the next frame. And odds are, consider the frames of this video that you're watching. Odds are that frame B is pretty similar to the frame that came before it. It could be completely different, but on average, one frame of video is pretty similar to the one before it. Uh, for all these segments where I just talk and don't draw, the frames are identical. And so in video compression, it's very common to leverage delta compression between frames. And that has a special name, which we're gonna use later in the course, P frames and B frames. And we'll come back to that in the last lecture when we talk about video compression. Uh, so we're going to talk about delta compression from the point of view of these rows of numerical data. So instead of storing, so here's my scheme idea, because as usual, this was a clever trick, this delta idea, but until you show me a bit stream, I'm not convinced. So instead of storing each row as a bunch of 16-bit values, the actual elevation, I will store each row as one absolute value, the one at the beginning, and then a list of differences, a list of delta values. Since it's relatively likely that deltas are small, I should choose an encoding that uses as few bits as possible for small delta values at the expense of maybe using tons and tons of bits for large delta values. That's one of the reasons why moving, by doing this transformation to delta values is so, is so important, because it's much easier for me to know what my priorities are when I'm working with deltas. Zero, one, and two, those are small deltas. I want to use a small number of bits. A thousand, I don't mind if that uses a huge number of bits based on my assumption that, that um, elevation changes that are massive are less likely to occur. So I could try representing each delta in eight bits using a fixed width representation. The problem with that is that if I represent the delta of 100, that's the same number of bits as a delta of zero. And even worse, what if my delta is 1,000? Well, I can't use eight bits for that. I'm in real trouble. So I, I probably don't want to use a fixed width representation um, because I, I couldn't use eight bits because I have to allow elevation changes that are more than eight bit, that span more than eight bit values. On the other hand, um, I, I should, well, I'll, I'll hold on this slide. Uh, we already know from the previous lecture, there are ways of using a variable number of bits for numbers based on their magnitude. And that's essentially where we're going. I have some histograms here that give us the distribution of delta values. So if we look at the delta values that show up row-based delta values, so if I take each row independently and I represent the first thing in the row by an absolute thing and then everything else by a delta, um, if I take a look at what deltas I get and look at the distribution, notice that the majority of them, in fact, basically all of them, like up to a tiny number, Number, it are less than four in magnitude. So almost all of them on our Gordon Head data set, which is relatively flat and close to sea level with only a couple of mountains, almost every delta is really, really small. On the Salt Spring data set, the distribution widens out a bit. Salt Spring has more mountains, it's got more diverse terrain, but even so, the vast majority of delta values are still about you know, five or less in terms of magnitude. Uh, the Stoamis data set widens it out further, um, and it's interesting to notice that for some reason it's not symmetric. Notice how the deltas seem, they're, they're more positive delta values, at least that we can see, than there are negative ones. Now that's actually a, I, I thought about that because I thought that 
If you see weird asymmetries in data, you usually have to explain yourself as a scientist. Um, if you scroll back in the video and take a look at the plot of the Stuamis data set, it sort of looks like this. There's water down here on the left-hand side of the data set, and then mountains over here. The mountains rise up from the water. So if I'm going left to right and computing my deltas left to right, it's far more likely that I go up then I go down, because I go up from sea level into the mountains, and over on the right-hand side, I'm still in the mountains. And that's why our deltas tend to be positive, because we tend to be going up if we're moving from left to right. So the reason that we have that skewed distribution is because we've chosen to go from left to right in our data set. If I look at a data set that's on the east coast versus the west coast, and I go left to right, then I should expect to see more deltas going downwards, um, and therefore the distribution would sort of be mirrored. But in all three cases where we see the histogram, notice how most of our deltas are still very small. They are less than 10, the vast majority of them. We'll also notice this huge spike at zero. A lot of deltas are equal to zero. Part of that is because if we look at areas that are all water, then obviously those are all going to be zero, and the difference between them is going to be zero, and so our deltas get stuck at zero. This could also be capturing some expanses of flat land. But one reason or another, if I expect there to be lots of zeros, that it gives me one motivation to make sure that the delta value zero is represented in as few bits as possible. In fact, I'm going to try representing all of my zero values in one bit. I want my zero deltas to be just the single bit zero, because that is as compact as I can make them using what I know so far in this course. Um, now, I, I may still see massive delta values every now and then. They could still appear. Even in this data set, they could be appearing. But this does give me motivation to optimize for small delta values. The majority of them are small. If I can make small delta values stored in a very small number of bits, even if some huge delta values get inflated, overall I should still make a profit. I should still end up achieving compression. So how do I encode my delta values? Well, we saw last time in the previous lecture there were a couple of ideas for how to use a variable number of bits. So one example was, so here's the value 7. I, if I want to represent in the previous lecture the magnitude 7, uh, in a variable number of bits, I could use unary, which is where I count off 7, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then I use a 0 to terminate the count. So unary is use a bunch of 1 bits to count to a number, and then use 0 to signal when you're done counting. Unary is one very simple, and I think like a good first try technique for using a variable number of bits. There was a more advanced technique we saw in the previous lecture that we could also use in this case. It would require some adaptation for signed values, which is why I'm not going to use it. It'll come up later in this lecture as an aside. Um, I can't use unary for the same reason. Um, unary is designed for unsigned values. I'm counting up from zero. What if I need to represent seven, but also negative seven? Well, I can't really do that in unary. I could, there are a whole ton of different ways I could adapt my unary representation to be both positive and negative. And you might be watching this and start yelling at the screen because you think the way I'm doing it is inefficient. And that's true. I'm going to have a second try in a few minutes. This is an iterative process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to design at first, as my first guess, I'm going to use a scheme that's sort of like unary, but sort of a bi-directional unary. So Unary, um, the unary we saw last time, so like the number three in unary, I count up using one bit. So one, two, three, stop. But I need the, the ability to count up and to count down. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, a zero still means stop. So you're counting from zero. You're either counting up or you're counting down. A zero means stop. Um, if I'm counting up, then to count up, instead of using a one bit, I will count up using this, one zero. So to count to three, so three in base 10 is going to be so one, two, three, stop. Negative three, to count down, I use one, one. So negative three in base 10 would be negative one, negative two, negative three, stop. Um, and then a zero in base 10 would just be stop. Don't count up, don't count down. Notice how this zero value is in one bit. That seems like a good idea because we saw there are going to be a lot of zero values. Okay, so we have this encoding. It's a first try. It's a bit bulkier because the ability to count both up and down requires me to use two bits for my counters. So I count up with one zero, I count down with one one. But it gives me an encoding and it does give me this ability to use a smaller number of bits for a smaller magnitude. 
Um, so then my delta encoding itself becomes, instead of, I, instead of having a row of 16-bit values, so this would require 96 bits to store all six of these in 16 bits a piece, what I can do is store the first value as an absolute value. So I could write that in binary, but it'll take up a lot of space on my slide, so I'll just use hex. This is 16 bits. Uh, I take this and then I compute my delta sequence, that would be this thing, and I store each delta value using the encoding from the previous slide. So plus 2 is now 5 bits, um, 0 is just 1 bit, negative 1 is 3 bits, and so on. And so the whole delta sequence ends up being 15 extra bits. So I'm now looking at 31 bits in total. So I've already achieved a compression ratio of 3 on my original relatively bulky 16-bit representation. Now I probably can do better, but that's a pretty good sign. I'm already achieving some compression, although I'm still on just one anecdotal example. Before I celebrate, I should test this scheme on actual data sets. Um, so I get a significant reduction, but what does that actually mean? Well, here is a benchmark. So I've taken my four data sets, and here are their uncompressed sizes. So ranging from about 700K for the Gordon Head data set to around 3 megabytes for the other two, and finally 180 megabytes for the Heinz data set. I have run um, my big three plus the Unix compressed tool, since that's probably on our minds these days. I've run all four of those on the data sets in their binary form. And I've run my new scheme, which I'm going to call row-based delta. I've run my new scheme on all four data sets as well. Now, of the big three, bzip wins across the board, which is interesting because I keep saying, I keep harping on in this course about how I think LZMA, on average, is the best general purpose compression tool. And yet, we've seen a few cases where gzip or bzip ends up winning. BZIP has a couple of natural advantages on this type of data, which we'll explore a bit more when we get to talking about BZIP later in the course. Um, and that's, I think, one reason why BZIP is winning. Although, if you notice, um, LZMA and BZIP are often pretty close to each other. So LZMA is coming in a pretty strong second in most of these data sets. So 10 versus, well, 10.9 versus 10.2, 9.8 versus 7.3, with everybody else trailing far behind. 4.96 versus 3.7, yeah. Um, 6.09 versus 5.05. Yeah, so LZMA isn't that far behind, but it's definitely like significantly far behind. Like there is uh, a significant difference between the two of them, even though LZMA is still putting in a respectable performance. Uh, I have run all three of the big three using their highest settings. So dash nine means use as much running time as you need, I guess, as much as you're willing to do to do all the compression you can. And LZMA dash nine dash E is turning on all, is pulling out all the stops to achieve compression. Uh, whereas bzip with dash one would be, okay, I want some compression, but don't, don't you know, worry too much about it. Let's get this done quickly. So my scheme, this new scheme I've developed, is already hitting a compression ratio of 7.6 on my Gordon Head data set. It is already, on my first try, beating the Unix Compress tool, beating LZW, and beating gzip. That's a pretty good sign. It's not yet really in the same league as LZMA or BZIP, but it's surprisingly close. And similarly here, I'm, I'm still beating GZIP and the Compress tool. Um, I am not beating GZIP on the Stawamis data set, and I, am having, I have sort of bad performance on the Hind data set. Um, in this lecture, we'll notice that the Hind data set often causes a bit of trouble for our schemes. One of the reasons for that is those invalid cells. And I guess I'll just do a huge scroll back now. Um, if we go back and look at the Hind data set and also admire our drawings from the meantime, we have these invalid cells. And these are, uh, in the binary format, they are given as 65535. We don't have any special logic to handle them. So when I go from from this from the invalid cell into a water cell, I'm going from 65535 to 0. And this gets encoded as an absolutely massive delta value. And so that's going to cause a lot of trouble um, for our delta-based models. Now, it could be attended to by just writing in special logic to handle invalid cells, uh, by handling them separately or something. But keep that in mind. Often we'll notice uh, unreasonably poor performance on the hind data set, basically, I think, because of the contribution of these invalid cells. So we'll scroll back. We'll catch back up to where we were. Um, so I have this very first scheme, and it's already putting in pretty respectable performances on some of our data sets. That's a good sign. And our question, of course, is, you know, what can we do to improve this? Um, I, I should add, there's one other 
unnatural advantage bzip gets. 10.95 is an incredibly good compression ratio. One thing about bzip that gives it a natural advantage here is that if you use bzip-9, bzip is a block-based compressor. It, it reads in a constant size block of data and then compresses it and then goes to the next block. If you use dash 9, the block size is set at 900k, which means that on this data set, bzip is reading the entire data set as one block. So it's able to leverage the context of the entire block. gzip, for example, might not be doing that. gzip might be using a smaller block size. And we'll talk, we'll see about what block size gzip uses later. Uh, when we do this, when we compare our compression schemes, ones that we've built ourselves, to bzip or gzip or lzma, we have to be careful to understand, of course, that bzip and lzma and gzip, they are all complicated schemes with lots of different steps, and therefore, by default, they are probably squeezing a lot of bits out of our data. We're currently trying basically one thing and already competing with those. We're already sort of catching up to bzip and lzma on the Gordon Head data set. So don't, let's not be too hard on ourselves if we can't quite get there. Also keep in mind that lzma especially, but the big three might use more memory than our simple schemes or take uh, longer to run. So of course our question is, wow, we've already done something, but that was our first try. Can we do better? Okay, so one thing I notice is that our encoding scheme for deltas is a little bit inefficient. And the way, I, the way I can come to the inefficiency is by noticing a certain form of redundancy. Let's consider how we encode plus three again. So plus three in base 10. Well, the way naturally I'd want to do that is there's plus one, plus two, plus three, and stop. So I count to three and then I stop. But this mechanism isn't just a mechanism to count directly to the number, it's just a series of increments that you can combine in any order you want. So plus three is also representable as, okay, I'm gonna go count up by one, there's two, then I'm gonna count back down to one, then back up to two, then up to three. So this would be one, two, one, two, three, and stop. Because I'm allowed to count up and down in the same representation, there is more than one way to represent each number. In fact, there are an infinite number of ways. There are an infinite number of bit sequences for each possible delta value. Now, why is that a problem? It's a problem because if I can represent three by this seven bit sequence, well, that's nice, but I can also represent three by this 11-bit sequence. And that means that there's an 11-bit sequence being eaten up by the number three. So some other delta can't use an 11-bit sequence because I've wasted an 11-bit sequence on the number three. So if I have more than one way of representing a number, then I'm sort of polluting the space of possible bit strings by eating up more bit strings than I need, which means that some other bit strings will need more bits. So maybe I can find some way of eliminating this redundancy. I only need one way to represent the number three or the number negative three. Maybe I should make it so that either I'm counting down or counting up. I'm never allowed to combine up and down increments in the same representation. So I'll do that using this scheme. What I really want to do, there are a variety of ways of doing this. My priority is I really love having zero deltas be one bit long. I think that's a great thing to preserve. So if my zero delta is always going to be one bit long, so if a delta of zero is the, the single bit zero, that means any other delta value has to start with a one bit. Okay, so that's one observation to make. So suppose that I'm representing the value, let's do the value negative three. Okay, so negative three, well, it's not the value zero, so it has to start with a one bit to distinguish it from the value zero. And then what I'll do is use the second bit to indicate whether I'm counting up or counting down. So in this case, a one bit as the second bit means I'm counting down, means I'm going negative. And then I ask myself the question, if I am not representing a delta value of zero, is there any way that this could end up being the value, like this is never gonna be the value zero because I know I'm counting either up or down from zero. And I would argue that what that means is that if I want to now count to three, I shouldn't start counting at zero, I should start counting at one. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna count to negative three starting at negative one. So this is gonna be negative one, there's negative two, there's negative three, and then stop. If I want to do positive three, then my second bit is zero. So I use my first bit as one, my second bit is zero, and I'm going to count up to three from positive one. Because if I've already gotten a one zero, it means I'm not working with a delta of zero. So why should I count up from zero? I'll count up from one. 
So one zero, and then I, so that's a one, two, three, and then stop. So you'll notice that in the encoding, if I want to represent the value n plus one, I use n one bits. So if I want to represent the value three, I use two one bits because I don't need three one bits, because if I'm not representing a delta value of zero, why should I count up from zero? I can be counting up from one or counting down from negative one. This is a bit more compact, and notice how the decision about which direction I go is only made once. In the previous scheme, I'm allowed to go up and then down, whereas in this scheme, I choose with this second bit, am I going up or down? And then I just count off how far up or how far down am I going. So I don't have this redundancy. I now have only one way to encode the value. Uh, and this is still sort of unary-like. I'm using unary to count off the magnitude once I've decided whether the number is positive or negative. Uh, and this is more compact. So my encoded bit stream in this case is, well, I'm still going to store the first value as an absolute 16-bit value. There it is. And then I use this new scheme to represent my deltas. In this case, uh, I end up using 14 extra bits. In the previous one, I used 15. So I get a tiny improvement. Um, but I observe that as the bit string gets longer and longer, with my old scheme, I need two bits for each increment. So for the value, if I want to represent the value 10, for example, I would need 21 bits. So 2 times 10 plus the 0 bit. Um, whereas in this scheme, it seems like it's more compact for larger increments. Once I set up which direction I'm going, the number of bits increases uh, with just one bit uh, per extra increment. So I don't, have to, I don't have this two bits per increment deal. So that should give me some reason to believe that as delta values get larger, although the improvement I'm seeing here isn't that big, as delta values get larger, I should see some benefit in addition to that lack of redundancy. And sure enough, here it is. So I have now created a scheme I'm going to call improved row delta versus row base delta. And you'll see that in all cases, it does achieve an improvement over my previous scheme. Now in my Gordon Head data set, I'm looking at a compression ratio of 8. I am actually catching up to BZIP and LZMA. Um, in my uh, salt spring data set, I'm still uh, ahead of gzip and the compressed tool. I'm not quite caught up to bzip and LCMA. Um, in the Stuwamis data set, I am now beating gzip. Previously, I wasn't. Previously, gzip was ahead of me. My new scheme is now beating gzip, so I've made progress. I've caught up to one other scheme. Um, and in the Heinz data set, I am also uh, beating gzip and compress. I mentioned earlier that one difficulty in the Heinz data set is these huge delta values that are computed when you go from an invalid cell down to water. And because my new representation represents deltas more efficiently, it does seem like maybe that, that problem could be ameliorated a little bit in my new scheme. And sure enough, my new scheme is um, getting better performance than gzip and the compressed tool. Uh, and so this is just summarizing what I've said a few minutes ago, which is uh, deltas of zero are still only one bit. If the delta is non-zero, then the length of the encoding increases linearly with the value of delta, although that was actually true before because linearly it was still, it was just by increments of two instead of one. In this case, it is one extra bit uh, for each increment of delta. So that's a, that is definitely more efficient than our previous scheme that used two extra bits. So, of course, the question is still, can we do better? We've already managed to get a pretty decent scheme just with the idea of delta compression, as well as a convenient and efficient representation of delta values that prioritizes small numbers of bits for small delta values. Can we do better? And there's this question. Why are we um, really investing that much in just the previous cell? Hmm, what is that, what is that supposed to mean? Well, I can embody it, I think, in this, in this thought experiment. Here I have 17, 18, 19. What is the next value going to be? Just as a human, guess. Pause the video and guess what is the next value going to be. So the schemes we've been using so far have said, well, what we're going to do is store the next value. Suppose that the next value is 25. Well, that means the next value is way up here. What we do is store this next value with a delta of 6. What we do is basically assume that the next value will be the same as the previous one. We're going to assume that the next cell is going to be 19. And then if there's a difference, if that assumption is wrong, we store the error. That's what the delta really is. The delta is saying, um, based on the previous cell and assuming that the next cell is the same as the previous cell, how far off was that guess? But 
if we're working on the basis of a guess, why is that our guess? Why are we assuming that every time we look at a cell, it's going to be the same as the one to its left, plus or minus an error that we end up storing? If we're allowed to make a guess, couldn't we make a more educated guess? So it's true that we can't just have our scheme randomly guessing, but we could use a prediction technique. As long as the decompressor can do the same prediction we do, we could use a prediction technique so that our deltas end up being a bit smaller. So the te we are already actually doing that. It, the, the improved delta model we just created was created with this assumption that every cell is probably going to be the same as the one before it. And if it isn't, it'll off, be off by a small amount. So we'll begin by assuming that the cell is going to be 19. And then if it isn't 19, the delta we store represents that difference. It represents the error. If it comes out to be 20, the delta is going to be 1. If it comes out to be 18, the delta is going to be negative 1. But if you stare at this, what do you think the next cell is going to be? I look at this and say, it looks like we've got a gradual slope. It looks like we've got terrain that's ramping upwards. Is it possible that this is the top of the mountain? Absolutely. If I keep walking upwards, eventually I do reach a plateau. The elevation doesn't increase without bound. However, if I look at the side of a hill and I pick a random location, so here's a hill, here's the top of the hill. If I pick a random location on this hill, what's more likely, that I've just reached the peak of the mountain or that I'm on the side of the mountain? I would say this is more likely. So if I see a, a, a uniform linear progression upwards, I would guess, if you asked me to guess the next cell, I would say, you know, I think the next cell is going to be 20. And if I'm allowed to make a guess like that, maybe that results in better compression. So we could predict, based on the previous two values, that the next cell has the value 20. And if you're the decompressor, and you've already decompressed 17, 18, and 19, and I computed, if I'm the compressor, and I guessed 20 based on the previous three values, you, the decompressor, could also make that prediction. As long as the prediction logic is deterministic, the decompressor can make all the same predictions as the compressor, because the decompressor has all the same data the compressor was using. As long as the compressor is only using data the decompressor already has. So I could predict the next cell is going to be 20 based on the two values before it. Uh, and the decompressor can make that same prediction as well. Um, oops, turns out the next value is 21. That's too bad. But wait a minute. If I predicted that the next value was 20 and the decompressor has that prediction as well, the delta value I store is based on the prediction, which means I'm storing a delta of 1. If I was using my previous technique, I would be storing a delta of 2. And we know already, the smaller the delta is, the better our compression gets. So this idea of prediction, using my context to estimate the next value, and then storing a delta based on the error from that estimate, this already gives us a reason to believe it could give us better compression. Now, we should also look for the downside of that. If we, make, if we guess differently, then there are different ways our guess can be wrong. So uh, if I look at, if I'm staring at this situation and say, so what's the value of the next cell? Well, I'm currently uh, sort of ramping up by a, a larger amount. I went from 19 to 21. So that's an increase of two. I will predict that that increase continues. I'm on a slope that's going up by two at a time. So if I go up by another two, I'm going to predict the next cell is 23. Okay, so I predicted it to be 23. Oops, I was wrong again. It turns out that the next cell was 22. So it turns out that I actually was looking at a bit of a less steep slope than I thought. So in this case, my prediction is off because it's too high. I predicted 23, but the delta is actually going to be negative 1 because the real value was 22. Okay, if I didn't use prediction, I would have predicted the value to be 21, in which case I would have stored a delta of um, positive 1. So in this case, I see no advantage to the predicted version because the delta is going to be 1 either way. In the previous case, I saw an advantage because the prediction got me closer to the real value than the old uh, variant, which would have predicted it to be 19. Um, okay, the next value is pre predicted to be 23 because, again, the previous two cells have a more gradual slope. Oh, but I'm wrong again. In this case, I was at the top of the hill and the cell had the value 22. If I had not used prediction, if I had used the previous model where I just assumed that each cell is equal to the one before it, then I would have stored a delta of zero under the old model. And under my new model with predictions, I'm storing a delta value of negative one. I predict 23, but it comes out to be 22. Okay, so this prediction idea seems like it might help us in cases where our terrain is something we can estimate in cases where we can leverage a pattern we've seen over multiple cells. But on the other hand, it could still be wrong. 
We're not allowed just to make a guess. We are allowed to make a guess if we have a way of correcting the error, if we can use a delta value to correct the error, because of course we need to achieve lossless compression. So the idea, I guess, and this is a bit of a busy diagram, so I'll draw a second one over here. Um, if I have a bunch of cells, let's call this one x1, and let's call this one x2, and I want to ask the question, what is x3? I don't know what x3 is. Well, in my previous version, what I was doing was saying, well, I'm going to assume that x3 is just equal to x2 plus whatever delta I compute. So I assume that x3 is the same as x2 and then generate a delta for whatever the offset is. Um, in my new version, in my predicted version, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, x3 is going to be extrapolated. I'm going to guess that x3 is um, up here because the difference between x1 and x2 led to an incline. x1 was below x2, so x2 um, increased in altitude from x1. What I'm going to do to compute x3 is I'm going to take the altitude of x2 and add to it the difference between x2 and x1. So extrapolating, assuming that the slope continues in the same way. So then I assume x3 is up here. And if I need a delta, I, I generate the delta based on this prediction. Uh, and so this formula ends up coming out to 2 times x2 minus x1, which is where this more general version comes from. Uh, so I extrapolate, based on the previous two cells, the value of the next cell. And that would give me the sequence, if I look at the predictions, so blue are the predicted values, uh, then I get this sequence of predictions. Sometimes the prediction is absolutely right, sometimes the prediction is off. In cases where it's off, maybe it's only off by one, and it's therefore sort of symmetric to if I hadn't predicted at all. But in general, because I do believe, based on our previous observations, that terrain does often tend to be sort of gentle slopes or predictable slopes. Even a steep slope often tends to be uniform just because of sort of properties of terrain maybe this prediction idea can help. The more context I can leverage intelligently, the more likely I can achieve smaller delta values. Um, there's also, I guess, one other question, which is, wait, if I'm doing predictions and I'm trying to predict x2, so here's x2. Um, if I'm trying to figure out the value of x2 and only have x1, what do I do? How do I use the two previous cells? Um, okay, well, in that case, I guess I do just predict x2 to be the same as x1 because I don't have any more context, if I'm at the very edge of my data set, I don't know what to predict. So when it comes time to predict this cell here, I, I don't have a slope to work on, so I'll just predict it to be 17 and compute a delta based on that. That's my boundary case. So here is the delta sequence produced um, with this scheme based on um, our new technique and our prediction technique. And here is the delta sequence produced with the old scheme, without prediction, or with the more basic, I guess, zero with order prediction. This delta sequence is all ones and zeros. This delta sequence includes a two. So there's one bit of anecdotal evidence that our prediction might help us. Uh, but, I mean, don't take my word for it. Uh, maybe we should look at the benchmark results. So here I've created a new model called predictive rho delta. That would be my improved rho delta model, but with prediction. So using the previous two cells, using the formula that I gave. Um, I'm getting an incremental improvement on my Gordon Head data set. So it is an improvement. I'm saving about four kilobytes, although not the most massive improvement. On the other hand, I am observing a massive improvement on the Salt Spring data set. I go from 5.8 to 8.67. And I just want to make it clear, I have now beaten LZMA. LZMA is a tool developed by lots of people using lots of research and compression, and I am now beating it on this data set um, using my basic prediction idea and delta compression. And 8.67 is not that far behind BZIP. I have a chance, if I can squeeze a few more bits out of this, I have a chance of being competitive with the winner, being competitive with BZIP. Uh, over on Stuamis, I've won. On Stuamis, I am achieving a compression ratio of six compared to BZIP's just under five. I would say that's pretty amazing. Um, and I'm also, of course, beating LZMA. Uh, I, uh, I'm way ahead of LZMA at this point on this data set. So I'm beating BZIP by a decisive margin. I'm going to six instead of about five. I think that's a huge deal. So one reason for that, which I think the slide is going to talk about in a minute, is that Stuamis has all these steep inclines. It goes up and down a lot. 
On the other hand, they are steep, but they are sort of regular inclines. So my prediction can really help with that, can help to generate lower delta values. On the other hand, if I have a steep incline and I'm not using prediction, all of my deltas are going to be large because the values increase a lot at each step. So once I introduced prediction, I was able to save a ton of bits on the Stuwamis data set. Over here on the hind data set, I'm still lagging behind the other ones, but I am putting in a much more respectable performance. Before, I was really sort of, uh, I was lagging behind with the Unix compress tool in gzip. Gzip is actually a very nice scheme, but it's not very good for this, I guess, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, here, bzip is still beating me, but 4.4 is catching up to LZMA. I'm, I'm getting close to being in the same league as LZMA and bzip. That's a massive improvement, and I'm not done yet. Um, one interesting secondary experiment I could do is I could take the output of my new predictive model. So I could take this 83 kilobyte thing and try compressing it again with one of the big three. So notice that when I take the output of my predictive row model and I compress it with bzip, it ends up being 62 kilobytes. If I compress it with LZMA, it ends up being 59 kilobytes. Um, there are a couple of interesting I implications from this, which we're not going to pursue much further, but this is a useful test to do every now and then. So the fact that once I am done compressing my data, so I've already compressed my data with my own scheme and it comes out at 83k, the fact that one of my standard compressors can squash that further is a sign that even inside of my 83k output there must be some patterns that I can exploit because how else could the compressor achieve this result? Um, that's a sign that maybe I can do better. Maybe I can take my predictive row delta model and improve it further. There's a sort of converse effect that we can observe, which is notice how when I combine schemes together, LZMA and my scheme together win and they beat BZIP. That, that means a couple of things. One is the interesting observation that LZMA seems to have a better time compressing this data than compressing the original data. Something that I do to my data makes it more palatable for LZMA, um, which is sort of interesting, I guess. Uh, and it is also, it's also worth observing, I think, that um, for whatever reason, what I've done to my data, even if I just look at bzip, what I've done to my data has made it easier for the standard compressors to work on. So that's another sort of converse effect. I've done something to reorganize the data that has made it easier for standard tools to digest, which also is a sign that I'm sort of on the right track. I'm identifying patterns in my data. But we, I think, can still do a little bit better. So our basic model, so let's just go back a couple of steps and talk about the non-predictive model. So that would be the model where I assume with no other information that the next cell is at the same altitude as the previous cell. And my delta is computed based on the, the absolute difference between the cell and its neighbor with no prediction. Let's think about that. So that model computes each delta value by taking a look at, let's maybe label our cells. It takes a look at the, the cell that we're encoding, we'll call that cell X, and the cell to its left, cell Y. Um, so in a sense, it does this. It computes each delta just to be the difference between the cell we're working on and the cell to its left. Now, the first element of each row, so if I look at each row, I have no choice but to store the first element as an absolute value because there is no, nothing, to its, um, there's nothing to its left to store a delta on. And there's a reason that this is actually a good idea to store it as a 16-bit absolute value, which is that if I tried to store this as a delta, so if I called this, if I pretend that there's a zero next to it or something, and I store this thing as a delta of plus 16, 600, this will probably take way more bits than if I just store the first element in binary as a 16-bit value. But I think, you know, it sounds like context really has been helping me out a lot. And this idea that I'm allowed to use any context I want in the compressor as long as the decompressor already has that context. So, for example, in the predicted model, I leverage the fact that by the time I get to this cell here, the decompressor already has these three cells. So I can use them as context. Um, but if I think about it further, if I look at my entire 2D array, by the time I get to this cell here, what does the decompressor have? Well, the decompressor has everything over to the left, but the decompressor also has everything above it, which means if I want to estimate the value of this cell here, I could use the one to its left as context, 
and I could use the one above it, or even the one diagonally above it as context. I could use the thing above and the thing to its left. And maybe if I want to estimate the value of this cell, I could estimate it using both the thing above and the thing to its left to get a more likely estimate. So I, I could try developing, this is still not a predicted model. It's still just using a single neighbor. So just the cell X and the cell above it and the cell to its left. And I, I compute my delta based on those. So if I'm working, let's take a look at the entire image. If I'm working in the top row of my grid, well, then I compute the delta the same way I was doing before. I just compute it based on the cell to its left. If I'm working in the first column of the grid, I can compute the delta based on the cell above it all of a sudden. I no longer have to store the first entry of the row as an absolute value because I can compute a delta. I still have to store the very first element, the top left element, as an absolute value. But I can now compute deltas based on what comes to the left and what comes above. And if I'm in the middle of the grid, so I'm not in column number zero or row number zero, I can compute the delta based on the thing to its left and the thing above it. And what I'll do to estimate the value of the current cell is I'll compute the delta based on the value of the current cell minus the average of the cell to the left and the cell above on the grounds that those two cells together give me a better indicator of the height of this cell than just one of them separately. And as boundary cases, uh, when I'm on the edge of the grid, I use either the cell to my left or the cell above me as a way of computing delta. And that means only the very first element of the grid has to be computed, has to be stored as an absolute value. Um, I'm going to call this scheme, where I use both the thing to its left and the thing above it, as up left. So I'll call this UL delta or up left delta. This scheme is based on this. There is no prediction. It is using the same encoding as my improved row delta scheme, but it is uh, using both the cell to the left and the cell above based on this formula to compute each delta. And we'll notice that as a result, um, it is definitely an improvement on the improved row delta scheme um, in all cases. It is not necessarily an improvement on the predicted scheme. Strangely, in the Gordon Head data set, it is. Having that extra context, even without prediction, does give it a better performance than the predicted rho delta. On the other hand, the predicted rho delta model is still better on the other data sets. So it's still winning on Stuamus, which is good, um, and it still performs pretty well on the other two. Um, and this new scheme, which does not use prediction, uh, isn't catching up to it. Um, but on the other hand, that shouldn't surprise us because predictive row delta is one way of improving my improved row delta and up left delta is another way. What if I just combine them together? Why don't I try and use this insight of taking both the cell to the left and the cell above as well as some kind of prediction logic, which of course I can do. So I can refine my up left model to be predictive using a very simple prediction. So what I'm gonna do is basically say, here's my cell X. I'm gonna look at the two cells uh, to its left and sort of determine the trend based on those. I'm going to look at the two cells um, above it and determine the trend based on those and then average it out. Average out the estimate computed from above and to the left to uh, predict the value of cell X and then take the delta based on that. So I'm going to define my delta to be the actual cell value minus my prediction and I'm going to define my prediction um, based on what I just described, where if I'm in, so here's my big image. If I'm in the middle of the grid, I define my prediction from the left and from above. If I'm on the edge, I have a bunch of sort of special cases. So that's these two situations. If I'm in the first row, then I define my prediction based only on the cells to the left. If I'm in the first column, then I define the prediction based only on the cells that are above. And for the sake of simplicity, suppose let's take a, a very close look at the top um, Let's do the very top row. Suppose I'm looking at this cell here. This is the second cell in on the top row. How do I predict its value based on the two cells to the left? Well, there's this cell over here, but what about this? I mean, I can't go off the grid, can I? Well, for notational reasons, let's allow us to do that. Let's say that we'll call this cell um, x0 and this cell x1. What I'll do is, for the sake of making the prediction easy to compute, if I look at the value of x negative 1, that's, I'll draw x correctly. So x negative 1, we'll just say, look, if you're wondering what the value, if I run off the grid to the left, let's just define that to be the same as the leftmost column. 
So um, notionally, we'll, we'll invent an imaginary value x negative 1 comma j is just the same as x 0 j. So if I walk off the edge, I keep the same value as I had on the edge. I just extend my boundary outwards. Um, that way I can still compute this prediction function without making an enormous mess of the equation. So one way or the other, um, TLDR, if I am predicting a cell here, I'm using the two cells to its left and the two cells above it. And that gives me a model called predicted up left delta. And we can see it is now winning on Stoamis because it is an improvement on my basic predicted row based delta. So it's getting 6.87 instead of 6.03. And if we survey the other results, they're pretty promising. 9.6 for Gordon Head. I'm slowly closing in on LZMA and BZIP, although there is still a decent difference. Um, for Salt Spring, 9.56 versus 9.83. I am right on the heels of BZIP. If I can squeeze a few more bits out of this, I can catch up and win on Salt Spring. I am winning on Stuamis, and on Hind, it's 5.7 more or less versus 6.09. I'm catching up pretty fast. My previous record was 4.4. But we're not done yet. So we were talking at the beginning, an hour ago, about RLE. And there is definitely at least one place in this scheme where RLE would really help us. So here is a bunch of water cells. They all have elevation zero. Notice that if you see one water cell, you're probably going to see a bunch of other ones. And some of our data sets are full of water. And these are all going to be currently in our predicted model. All of these are going to resolve out to long sequences of zero deltas because of course each water cell is definitely exactly equal to um, the cell next to it and it will be predicted it to be zero and so we end up with a bunch of zero deltas. A long run of zero deltas. So a run, huh? We were talking about run length encoding and now that we have if all goes well, a prediction logic that will produce lots and lots of zero deltas and these huge bodies of water that'll definitely be full of zeros, maybe now is a time to bring in RLE, to do some run length encoding. Uh, I'm not going to belabor how RLE works. Go back and watch the previous lecture for that. Uh, so if our predictions are good, then we will have lots of zero deltas in water, certainly, but maybe in lots of other places. Maybe on uniform slopes, this will be predicted very well, and we'll get a lot of zero deltas here, maybe all in a row. So RLE, especially an RLE optimized for zeros, runs of zeros, would really help here, or could really help here. I, I'm thinking a bit too far ahead. Uh, so even though my zero deltas are represented in one bit per delta, that's a lot of bits. If I have thousands of, of water cells in a row, that's thousands of bits, even with only one bit per cell. If I use run length encoding, I could end up using fewer than one bit per cell by packaging together all of those zeros into one run of zeros. So I'm going to, def I'm going to uh, tack on at the end of my compression scheme, I'm going to add some RLE stages and see what happens. Um, and I should add that one of the reasons BZIP is doing so unnaturally well on these data sets is, as we've heard before, BZIP is full of RLE. And that might be helping to clean up some of those water cells in advance in a way that BZIP benefits from a bit more than the other schemes. Even though GZIP has built-in RLE functionality and so does LZMA, maybe BZIP's particular brand of RLE is really helping it here. So I'm going to add two new schemes to my set of schemes. Uh, and they're both going to be based on this, because at this point, I believe this is the best model to work from. It's, it is an improvement of all four of the others. So all I really care about now is how do I make this one better? Uh, I'm going to do two different models. One of them is going to be called the uh, predicted UL delta plus RLE. It's going to be based on a unary run length encoding. So exactly the same uh, unary run length encoding RLE that we saw in the previous lecture. The other scheme is going to be, I'm going to call that RLE2, plus RLE2. Um, I'm going to be using a, a run length encoding with that variable bit representation from the previous lecture. I won't go back through that now, but the previous lecture does talk about that. Uh, in both cases, I'm using a BZIP style RLE scheme. So that means that I only emit a run encoding if I've already seen a run of at least three delta values, or, or at least four. So if I see only three deltas which are the same in a row, I just encode them normally. But once I see the fourth delta that's equal, then I emit a run length using one of these two encodings. So I now have two new models based on the previous best contender that I had, uh, and I've added run length, two different run length encodings to produce them, and I get this. So my here's my predicted, the previous best, predicted UL delta, and it was 
doing pretty well. And here are my two new RLE-based schemes. And it looks as if RLE2, the one based on this variable encoding, which leverages some of the best of both worlds, both unary and binary encodings, this one here at the bottom is definitely our winner. And I mean literally, it is our winner. It is now winning on three of the four data sets. Now, the other RLE one that used strictly unary is still doing pretty well. I mean, it's actually sort of competitive with RLE2, but RLE2 is winning. And I think by a decisive enough amount. So 7.07 .07 versus 7.10, that's not so much. But if I'm seeing, you know, maybe 0.1 at least extra in all three cases, I think I can trust that my that this scheme is seems to be more reliable, especially given the scale of the data. So 30 megabytes um, down from 180. I think that means that if I had to choose a scheme in general, I would now choose this one. I would very much like it if I could say that this scheme wins across the board, but no, it doesn't. It doesn't quite win on Gordon Head. But I at least get the chance to be grumpy about this. Please take a look at how much it's winning by, if we look at bzip. bzip is winning by two bytes. My scheme that I just developed in this lecture is 65321, bzip is 65319. Two more bytes and I would be tied with bzip. Three more bytes and I would be winning across the board. Now, it's an exercise for the viewer, I guess. It turns out that there are actually quite a few ways of um, saving a few bytes here. One of them is adding more logic to handle invalid markers. I think we could improve quite a bit on these numbers um, just by doing that. But before we go further, um, let's just take a look at how much I'm winning by. So I have achieved a compression ratio of 11.8, more or less, on the salt spring data set. That is up from the previous record of 9.83. That is a huge improvement. So 50K out of about 300. On the Stawamis data set, I went from 4.96 to 7.1. Um, so I'm up from, uh, instead of 600K or 590K, I'm now down at 411. That's a huge deal. And on Hind, a data set that I've already mentioned our schemes have a bit of difficulty on, I'm still decisively outperforming BZIP. So this combination of prediction, delta encoding, and RLE has now won, and I think really we can count this as a win across the board because it's one tie and three decisive victories. Now, I'm about done talking about this for today, but there are a few other open questions. If your task was to develop a scheme just for this data, you could probably do quite a bit better than just 30 megabytes on this 180 megabyte file. You could probably improve on all of these numbers a decent amount. I don't think, I think that there's air yet in this data. I think there's still ways to achieve compression. And one way we don't, we haven't seen yet, that all three of the big three are using is something called entropy coding. The next few lectures are gonna talk about that. Combining an entropy coding technique with this would probably yield amazing results. It would probably result in much smaller file sizes. You'd, you'd achieve a substantial improvement. Um, beyond that, there's also, what do we do about invalid cells? So currently, if we see an invalid cell, let's say next to water, it will be interpreted as a cell with elevation zero next to a cell with elevation 65,000, which requires the emission of an absolutely massive delta value. Adding some special logic to handle that would probably make result in significant improvements on the hind data set and other data sets with invalid values. Um, is it possible to encode delta values more efficiently? So we encoded our delta values using this sort of unary-like procedure. But then later in the lecture, we brought back this combined unary-binary um, encoding technique for run links. Maybe we could use this as a the means to synthesize a better way of encoding delta values. There's also the question about what about speed? I'm going to sort of... Um, I'm going to punt on that. For this lecture, what I will say is that all of the schemes that we benchmarked, all of the homemade schemes, had relatively fast performance that was competitive with these three. A little bit faster than the big three, but um, otherwise I haven't done a timing benchmark. Um, because these don't tend to do as much work, they, they are easier to make run relatively quickly. But in the grand scheme of things, if you're encoding one terabyte of data, then yes, yeah, speed is probably a thing. And then can we, what is it about BZIP's encoding pipeline that's so well equipped for this? Like LZMA is generally pretty good and often better than BZIP. Why does BZIP have such a singular advantage on this data set? I gave a few theories. Once we've seen the BZIP pipeline further, maybe you can come back to this and maybe you could see a few reasons BZIP might be performing so well.
Um, so here is our complete set of, of um, benchmarks, the one we just saw a couple of minutes ago. Uh, for the sake of further context, I also created two huge data sets, so much larger than the hind data set. Uh, one of them is called Stuart. It's from the northwestern corner of British Columbia. In particular, I'm going to do a sketch that I, I'm going to be ashamed of here. If we look at the northeastern, uh, northwestern corner of British Columbia, up here is Alaska, and then here is BC. The Stewart data set is sort of taken from the along the border a bit. And that means there's actually going to be not that much into Alaska, but there's going to be a bunch of invalid cells because the CDEM model doesn't want to talk about the elevation of Alaska. So Stewart is full of invalid cells, and I suspect that the one sort of um, hazy spot in our performance is this Stewart data set. I suspect that the bad performance of our models on the Stewart data set has to do with invalid cells. On the other hand, I've also pulled a data set called Revelstoke, which is from the eastern interior of BC, which is a massive data set, um, and it's 500 megabytes. And we'll notice on that massive data set, uh, our uh, predicted uplift delta and RLE2 scheme also wins, as it did on the previous slide. Um, and we'll notice that BZIP and LZMA are way behind. So again, a difference of 4.2 or 4.9 versus 7. So we decisively win on Revelstoke, um, and we've got sort of nasty performance performance on Stewart, I wouldn't be surprised if that were primarily due to um, invalid cells. Now that said, although it's nasty, the other schemes don't do that well either. So we're not in the same league as BZIP or LZMA, but we're not that far behind. Uh, and if we consider the total, if we wanted to compress all of our different data sets together, so there are six data sets in total, these four, and then there's hind again, and then two extras. If we were to compress all of them together, then this scheme would probably overall win the competition at this point. It has such good advantages on everything but the Stewart data set that it probably would still uh, take the prize at the end. So what I think we should take away from this lecture is first, now we know what delta compression is. And second, now we know what prediction is. What's going to come back later on us is this idea that prediction itself was free. So we do predictions, and so here's our, we, we have our cells, we use the prediction logic to decide what the value of the next cell is, and then encode a delta. We know that if the prediction is good, the delta is small. And that's good because deltas can be encoded. We can bias our encoding to encode small deltas or frequently occurring deltas, which for our purposes today seems to be small ones, to encode small deltas uh, in a smaller number of bits. But notice that in that whole process, the prediction itself never got sent across the wire. The compressor made a prediction. The decompressor made the same prediction. The better the prediction gets, the better the encoding is. The, the smaller you end up getting um, in your compressed file size. And that means because uh, prediction logic is just a question of time and space, of memory, as opposed to compressed space, if you want to spend more time writing better prediction logic, you can get better compression performance. It just comes down to how much time do you want to spend predicting things. It's also true, those of you that are obsessed with AI and machine learning, that if you have a really advanced model for making predictions, that can result in really good compression performance. And if you therefore develop, let's say, a machine learning based model to do predictions, you could get really good compression. Um, the predictions we did today are very, very simple linear predictions based only on a small amount of context. Um, in a general scheme, doing predictions well, because the predictions are just a matter of how much time do you want to spend, can result in massive compression advantages. But of course, that's something we're going to talk about later. The next thing we're going to talk about in this course is something called entropy coding, which is going back to this idea of just having a bunch of symbols and needing some way of choosing a good number of bits for each symbol based on how likely we are to see that symbol or maybe how interesting each symbol is.